Well, always nice to see those kids, amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for the book of 1 John and all that it teaches us. Lord, we know that you have a special thing in mind for this message today, and God, we pray for those that are here listening and for those that are listening over the internet, Lord, that our hearts would be open to hear what you have to say through your word and that you give me the strength and ability to convey it in a way that is, that is meaningful and that honors you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, counterfeit. Who here has ever had a counterfeit uh, bill in their hands? Has anyone? If you've, if you've ever had a counterfeit bill in your hands, something about the feel of it just doesn't feel quite right sometimes, right? And uh, may, maybe, I, I'm sure that there's some very good counterfeits out there that uh, we probably handled and that we never actually knew were, in fact, counterfeits. Because, beca because counterfeits, and especially good ones, um, on first appearance, they have the look of real bills. But upon closer examination, they have that different feel about them. The paper is different. Uh, or they've mil missed a, a built-in security feature that the, uh, that the money actually has. Now, in Canada... The RCMP has a National Counterfeiting Bureau and, and a commercial crime branch, and the Bank of Canada and the Canadian Banknote Company offer training to people who are uh, in businesses, banks, and other places to try and prevent counterfeiting from undermining our system of currency. Counterfeiting has become a huge problem. I'm not preaching about counterfeiting money this morning, but counterfeiting not only causes financial loss, to whoever gets stuck with it, it also seriously undermines public confidence in the currency. If there's enough counterfeit out there, people will be reluctant even to accept cash. Confidence is essential because once confidence is lost, it is very hard to regain again. In a similar way, to counterfeit money, there are counterfeits of the Christian faith who upon initial appearance appear to be believers. But they have a different feel about them when you get close to them. And upon closer inspection, they're missing certain built-in security features that are with the original. Counterfeit Christians do great damage to churches that they are in. And once their identity is shown for what it really is, it undermines public confidence in the reality of the faith and the reality of the wonder-working power of the living God. If what is presented to the world upon first appearance seems genuine, but then later on proves to be a fraud, then confidence is lost and trust is broken. And confidence and trust are essential because once lost, confidence is very hard to regain again. And oddly enough, those who become proficient with identifying counterfeits do not become proficient by studying counterfeit bills so much as they do in becoming familiar with the fine details of what the real thing is. If they're familiar enough with the look and feel of real money, then when they, when they come across a counterfeit, they're immediately going to have the discernment to recognize that something is wrong. Now, in our text today, in 1 John chapter 2, 28, to chapter 3, verse 10, the Apostle John warns us that in today's world, there are counterfeits. They're counterfeit Christians. And some of them become false teachers that work themselves into um, assemblies. And in reality, they're not yielded to God, but they're in it for their own benefit. 
I remember meeting a fellow when I was a young man in church. And this guy was, char- he was charismatic in his personality, very outgoing, very friendly. He was like the salesman, you know, that was just polished. He, people really gravitated toward him. He had the gift of the gab and knew how to pull strings. Man, he seemed like such a nice guy. Everybody trusted him. And I never forget, our pastor even got pulled into this. This guy ended up becoming a youth elder without even being a Christian for a year. He just became a Christian and he was so charismatic and so, you know, oh, doing all the right things. He was appointed as a youth elder and the things that happened after that point, I'm going to tell you, were destructive. In the end, the man ended up f- fleeing from our church, having swindled people of more than $10,000 in the congregation to fund some project thing that he had with promises to pay back. He fled town, left, gone, counterfeit. Now, lest we go, eh, it's out there somewhere, I have to ask myself a question. Is my faith in Jesus Christ real? Is it real? Is it for real? Or is it counterfeit? Hmm. See, this morning I want to talk about counterfeit not because so much as to help us gain ammunition, get ammunition to go on witch hunts out there for the counterfeit ones. I think the Bible often teaches us things, yes, to warn us about false teachers and counterfeits that are out there, but also for us to look inside and and to examine ourselves, to see whether or not what is in there is genuine or whether it is a fraud. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5, in support of what John is going to be saying in this text here, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do do, Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. This, the purpose of John's writings is for us, yes, to protect the church and to, you know, to, to say, hey, yeah, this isn't right. Stay away from that. Or maybe the leadership of the church needs to deal with something. But I, this morning, I'm praying that all of us will examine our hearts. Like Paul says here, examine yourself. Um, the first two verses that I'd like to read are 1 John chapter 2, 28 and 29. John says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practice, practices righteousness is born of him. I like how John phrases this. This is written to the church. And John calls the recipients of his letter, which is us here today as well, he calls calls us little children. And when you think of little children, what do you think of? You think of someone that is, is just starting out. Someone that's just beginning to see the difference between right and wrong. Just beginning to perceive and discern the truth. The thought is that as believers, especially when we first come to receive Jesus as our Savior, we're just starting to understand the heart and plan of God. And and he calls all genuine believers to abide in Jesus because even if you've been a Christian for 65 years, the God of all eternity is so much vaster in his knowledge and his, in his ways. His ways are higher than our ways. Even as the heavens are higher than the earth, so his ways are higher than ours. So all of us, regardless of how mature we are here in the earth, in comparison to maybe someone that just gave their heart to Christ, we're still little children. And little children, he's, he's saying, abide in Jesus. Abiding in Jesus is encouraged because Jesus is God. 
Jesus is our creator. God used Jesus Christ in person to create the entire universe. Abiding in him, the apostle strongly states that those who are awake in their spirits to the presence of God will practice righteousness in reflection of the righteous character of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to read you a quote here that's several hundred years old. There, there was an uh, English theologian named Matthew Poole. And I, I think this quote really is applicable to what we're talking about today. So I'm going to read it. It's going to be up here on the screen. When someone is born of someone else, there is almost always a family resemblance. You say, look, she has her mother's eyes or he has his father's nose. I hope I don't have my father's nose, but maybe. Well, the children of God have a family resemblance to their father in heaven. He is righteous, so those who are born of him also practice righteousness. God hath no children destitute of his image or who resemble him not. So once John has finished stating the connection between righteous living and a relationship with Jesus, he then connects the relationship to the stable character of the love of God the Father. There's no accident in this joining of this next passage we're reading. In the original letter, there were no chapters, there were no verses. It was one letter. So it flows into the next. So consider what I just read in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 2 and what I'm about to read you in chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. And one cannot emphasize enough the greatness of the love of God. And John, when he's speaking here, he doesn't attempt to describe it, but he asks his readers to reflect on it, to ponder it, to absorb it, to, to examine it for what it is. Consider the wonderful love of God that has been poured out on us out of the overflow of the abundance of His character through the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider that. God had mercy on us. We talked about it while we were doing our worship service. God had mercy on us while we were still lost in our sins to forgive us and to bring us into His royal family adopting us as his daughters and his sons. And God wants us so much to understand how much he loves us, how vast, how deep, how wide his love is for us as his children. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 5, 6, and 8, Paul tells us, you see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And that's very personal because he died for you. For you. He saw all the way through history to this point right now and the God who is all-powerful and all-knowing before the beginning of time knew that you would be sitting here today listening to this message. And I want to encourage you. You may not feel lovable, but the God of all creation loves you and he calls you his own. You are very precious to him. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit is given. When we become 
believers in Jesus Christ. And we respond to the gospel, the good news spoken to us. The Holy Spirit tugged on our hearts. He tugged on us. And we responded. When we responded, we humbled ourselves before the mighty hand of God, acknowledging our need for a Savior. Before you're going to ever be saved, you need to understand that you need salvation, that you need a Savior. You need to recognize that without a Savior, you're lost. When we respond and humble ourselves to God, acknowledging our need, by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, our hearts are opened up to the reality of of God and His desire to have this loving, genuine relationship with us. And since we have come to faith in Jesus, we have drawn near to God. We've been forgiven of our sins and we're filled with His Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit within us as believers is the absolute game changer Without the Holy Spirit, there is no change. Christianity is not a philosophy. Christianity is not an ideology. Christianity in its essence is God with us. God with us. God living inside of us. As close as the mention of His name. A relationship with the living God. Romans 5, 8 or 8, 5, and 9 says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. The Holy Spirit lives within His children and brings us to new life. The Holy Spirit's work inside of the true believers transforms us inwardly from a worldly entity into a heavenly entity. His indwelling presence changes our behavior to reflect God's righteousness. And God calls us to be holy, even as He is holy. And He gives us, He doesn't just ask us to be holy and just command us to be holy without help. God calls His children to be holy even as He is holy, but He gives us the power to be the sons and daughters of God. He gives us the power through the Holy Spirit to be what He calls us to be. In 1 Peter chapter 4, 3-5, to the Apostle Peter speaks to the believers in Jesus saying, you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse upon you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So like Peter, like Paul, these three apostles, it's made plain that in this world it is inevitable that in the state of unrighteousness this world is steeped in, they're going to look at us as strangers when we come to Christ. When we are renewed inside and the Spirit of God dwells in us, we are going to become like strangers or outsiders who do not fit into their program and their way of doing things. And indeed, if we're true believers, we don't fit into that mold. It's like the old 80s music group. You ever, I used to listen to Petra. (laughs) That dates me. eh? Uh, Well, one of the songs they had there sang this song. We are strangers. We are radiant. We are not of this world. You are a stranger to this world. When you become a born-again believer, your allegiances switch. The Spirit of God inside you makes you different than the people around you. And they might not recognize it on the surface level, but something in them 
You ever had someone say they're, they're swearing away and cursing the name of the Lord and they know you're a believer and you walk into the room and they, oh, sorry about that, you know, sorry. I, I, I. What is that? Some don't care because they're hardened, but anyone, there is something in them that knows there's a difference between you and everything else that's out there. John tells the people that they ought not to be surprised that now that they are born again in the, in the Spirit, that they do not fit into this world system the same way that they used to. The unsaved world doesn't know what drives us. They can't figure it out. I've had people perplexed. They think that I'm doing what I'm doing for some other reason that I'm doing it. You probably have had the same kind of thing. It's completely off. It's like they don't get it. They don't understand relational connection with God. They think that there must be some psychological or material thing that you're pursuing what you're pursuing in Christ for. And it's true. In Romans chapter 121, Paul wrote, for, all they, for although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. When people's hearts are darkened, they no longer see God for the loving person that He is. A darkened heart views God's righteous standards, how do they view it? As oppression. They view it as oppression. And they, they, they view God's judgment against evil as unloving and somehow over the top and cruel. Those who have darkened understandings have bought into a lie that comes from the devil himself. It's spawned from the devil. And uh, the devil wants people to misunderstand the nature and character of God and create an image of God in their mind that is completely inaccurate from who God really is. True believers, you see, we understand the truth that has set us free. We understand that God is good all of the time. God is good. Those who refuse to glorify and give thanks to God for who He is. They don't see it that way. They have darkened understanding, darkened hearts. In their minds, Christians are cherishing false and delusional hopes in regards to the future, and they're not being compensated at all for their belief in their denial of earthly pleasures that they might otherwise enjoy if they were to indulge. They look at us and they think of us as foolish. But God has chose the foolish, chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the worldly wise. The Apostle Peter encourages us as believers in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, but you, speaking to the church, the true believers, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And the Apostle John continues in chapter 3, 2 to 3. He says, Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall be See him as he is. All who have this hope in him purifies them, purify themselves just as he is pure. John is very insistent on repeating a number of the principles that we're going through today. Repeats them over and over and over again because they're so important. He wants the church to be clear on these principles. In the written word of God where you find the subject matter being repeated, friends, it's a signal. It's a signal from the Lord that this is very important. Pay attention to this. It is important. And in this part of 1 John the Apostle, John re-emphasized the importance of believers living holy lives before God. This is important. 
in this progressive Christian environment where you, it just seems like everything is washed, where, where there's no right and wrong anymore. It's, well, well, maybe for you it's right and for me, I don't know, it's maybe not right for me, but for you it's right, welcome, yeah, this is good. It's all good just as long as you have the right um, you know, the right mentality about it, like that, that you accept me for who I am and I don't judge you, you, you don't judge me. This is the kind of world we live in, progressive Christianity. Now, God says, be holy for I am holy. What is holiness? Holiness is righteousness. The heart of God calls sin um, something that his, his children need to flee from. The heart of God actually that, that, that calls out sin actually describes sin, if you look at it throughout the scriptures, it, calls, it actually calls sin misdirected love in principle. What do I mean by that? Well, it's a disorder of affection where people who sin are loving the wrong things. They're buying into the lie in the garden. You would want to be like God. Okay, here you go. Come on. You can be your own God. You can make your own rules to the game. You don't have to listen to the principal fuddy-duddy stuff that, uh, that the Bible and God says. You, you can make your own rules and he'll accept you. Come on, just, oh, come on, God is really loving. He's going to accept you to doing the things that you want to do. After all, he wants you to be happy. He wants you to be a king's kid. You can do whatever you want, really, as long as, as, long as you just, you know, just watch yourself just a bit, you know. I just, oh, man. That's the, hundred, that's the fundamental human problem. This is why our, our first instincts in our sin nature are not to seek God, but to hide from Him when our affections are aligned to the wrong thing. You want to see a dead church? A dead church is filled with people that don't relationally understand who they are, who don't understand for God for who He is. If a church is dead, it's because they have bought in some form of lie. Jesus Christ is is alive. The Spirit of God is living and active. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God penetrates our very being and shows us what is spiritual and what is just all in our emotions. It separates the two, shows us, gives us discernment, shows us where we are loving the wrong things and asks us to repent when we see the wrong things after he convicts us. Friends, we all struggle with sin. No question about it. Every single one of us struggles with sin in this world because we carry along a sinful nature along with our redeemed nature. But, friends, we are not bound by the power of sin. We're no longer bound by the power of sin. Sin is no longer our master. It is an elective, and when a believer falls into sinful behavior, it's a denial of his or her new nature in Christ. Jesus has really given us newness of life. When the Bible says he wants us to be born again and that we won't see the kingdom of God unless we're born again, it means that we need to be alive. We need to be born again in the Spirit. And this isn't just a mental game where we, we go and do the sacraments and we cross our chest and we recite scriptures in our head. It's a connection point between our head and our spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes into us and lives in us. And when the Spirit of God lives within us, it is the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And He is holy. So the reaction of the Holy Spirit living inside of us is that automatically outpouring from our lives is holiness. Holiness is not something we grasp and we dig for. It's something that we become when we yield to the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it's just legalism. I'm actually taking charge of my life. I'm calling the shots. I can be holy. I can do the things that I need to do because I am in control. Guess what? You're not. The sooner we understand this, the better off we're going to be. 
When we understand that I'm totally inside of my spirit and I'm unable in myself to obey God, then I call out to him and I say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, I love you. I don't want anything coming in between me and you. I just want to be close to you, Lord. You're my father. You're my daddy. Abba, father. What breaks your heart, God? I want it to break mine. What makes you excited, Lord? I want that to make me excited. Verse 4 of our text, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Jesus didn't just come to save us from the consequences of our sin, although he has. He's, he's, He's come to take us away from the power of sin. Yes, when we accept Jesus, we're saved. But he has given us power in the Spirit to be the children of God, ones who are Christ-like ones, Christians. That's what Christian means, after all. That's what they said in Antioch about the believers. They called them Christians because they lived like Jesus, Christ-like one, Christian. No one continues, the, no one who lives in him, in verses 6 to 8, keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just, because he, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. God has come to set us free from the shackles of sin. It's not about just praying a prayer when you're five years old. It's about praying the prayer and believing and submitting your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what brings salvation, is submission to Jesus and making him our Lord and Savior. It's not just enough to cross a crucifix, to be baptized as a baby, to, to, to pray a prayer at a camp or at Sunday school once when you're a kid, and just, that's it. That's not what God's after. He's after Christ-like ones. Christ-like ones. It's plain in the scriptures here. And we've, sometimes we've bought into the lie that we can just be nominal. Although that's just being carried away now, Pastor. That's just being carried away. No, it's not. God has given you everything you need for life and for godliness in him. The spirit of the living God wants you to be like Jesus. And he's given you the provision to be holy as he is holy and to shine a light in this darkness of this world. The darkened hearts are blinded. But God can use you to shine light into the darkness. And for those who receive him, they will be given the power to become the sons and daughters of God. Because it's the Spirit that does the work. You're just a lantern. You're shining what's inside of you. The power isn't isn't you. The power is in you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Not greater am I because I am better than you. It's greater greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Outside of the grace of God, I have nothing. I am as lost as the next guy. But because of the grace of God that's been lavished, the love of God that's been lavished upon me, I now become a child of God. A child of God. A Christian. A Christ-like one. Verses 9 and 10, John says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remained in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Hmm. Why didn't God just destroy the devil right off the beginning? Why does he let him wander around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Why is it? We think that it would be best for God right now to finish the devil off. But folks, there's a good reason why he doesn't. Because it's all about love. 
And you don't have the capacity to love unless you have a choice. And if God is good and lives in holiness, the choice has to be opposite to him. Otherwise, it's the same thing. So God allows the enemy to be a catalyst to see who will place their trust in him and love him and choose him. This is why he does it, because there's no, there's no love in robotics. Yes, God has known you from the foundation of the earth. He knew that you would give your heart to Christ if you have. He knew that. He created the world and everything in it with you and us in mind. And this is the very best outcome because God's design was to gather a weed into his barn. It was to have children who would live with him forever, who would, who would be his children because they offered him their hearts. I know there's some theology out there that speaks against that, but that if you take love out of the equation, it's nothing but robotics. We have to have a choice. Otherwise, there is no way that we love. Just like you love your children. You love them, and they love you because you choose to. Because they're worth knowing. They're worth loving. God wants that same heart response to him. For us to see him in all of his glory, that he is worth knowing and loving and caring about. And when we give our hearts to him, he responds. He calls us first. God loves us first. He shows his love to us. And what we do with that now, you know, the gospel says, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The whole world has been given the love of God in a Savior. What will they do with it? That's the question. And God uses you as a light in the darkness. The love of God has been lavished on us. So in reflection of the character of God, the person who is filled with the Holy Spirit will love God and others with the same lavishness. Did you hear that? If you have a hard time loving other people, if you have a hard time loving other believers, there is a problem. There needs to be some heart surgery. There needs to be some mission, some repentance, saying, God, forgive me. There's something in me that's crusty and hard that needs to be broken so that I can trust and love and give myself to others to see them come ahead. The world says, protect what you have, keep your, to yourself, and do things for you and the ones that you are allied with. The love of God says, love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you and say all manner of evil against you. False. Love them, not just the ones that are close to you. You see the divergence? If our hearts are crusty before others, it's a sure sign that there needs to be some renewing with our first love. You know, love isn't used just in the sense of friendliness or mere human affection. It is divine love. And it has its source in God. Loving in ourselves is impossible. Long term, we're selfish. Only when God takes that out of us and instead fills us with his unselfish love is true love going to abound in us and through us? There's no strings attached. When you love others, you're not, you don't just love others because you want something out of them. You're not just loving them so that they can give you accolades and say, oh, you're such a good guy. Oh, Pastor Clint, you're such a good guy. Oh, thank you. No, it's like, I don't care what you think. I'm going to love you anyways, even if you hit me. Go ahead, hit me. I still love you. That's what Jesus did. Now, it's not saying we go around and, 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 and just put up with abuse. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the heart of love is giving and caring and, and you know, keeps no records of wrong. All this stuff, love thinks of building others up, not building self up. People can give everything they own to the poor to receive backpats and praises of man in this world. You're such a good guy. You're such a philanthropist. 
That's bus- bolstering the ego. That's not love, folks. <laughs> That's not love. Um, giving without being done in love for the ones that we are giving to amounts to nothing. Zilch. Zero. Similarly, we can have gifts of prophecy. We can prophesy from God and have discernment of spirits to supernaturally fathom all spiritual mysteries and we can have incredible heroic faith that would move the mountains and, or we could speak in the tongues of men and of angels. But if we don't use these giftings that God gives us out of a heart of love for the good of others, it's no, it's no more profitable or pleasant than standing in front of a person with two great big symbols going bang, clash, bang, clash, bang, clash. Because all activities which are not based on the love of God, all activities, whether they're talents, abilities, giftings, all comes to nothing unless they are based on the love of God for him and for others. Jesus' love Selfless. Philippians chapter 2. In the form of the greatest thing in, in all of the universe. Jesus is the creator. He is before all things. He is above all things. He speaks and things happen. He's the creator. By the word of his mouth, he creates things. He came to us and humbled himself. Why? Because he loved us. And that was the only way to bring salvation to the ones that he loves. That's why why John says here, consider the great love that the Father has lavished upon us. Lavish. You know what lavish means? Just like, like not just a little little bit of love. I love you just a little teeny teeny weeny bit. Just a little teeny weeny bit. That's how much I love you. I can't love you anymore because I've been too hurt in my life. I'm not going to risk loving you any more than that. No, no. God did not do that, did he? He lavished everything. It's all in. All in love. That's what he calls us to do with one another. Not just a little bit. Yeah, you get my love, but eh, you know, stay over there in your corner. I'll stay in mine. I'll love you a little bit here and a little bit there, but... Man, it's too risky to love you because I risk getting hurt by you if I open my heart to you. Man, that's not the love of God. The love of God is like, here is my heart. I love you, and I will show you that I love you by how I treat you and what I do, how my feet hit the ground, not just by what I say. The love of God lavished upon us by the Father ought to be the same love that we lavish upon each other. Love. Love. These words were not written by the apostle so that we could run checklists on other people's activities, like I said. This is personal. He wants you to respond and say, Lord, I need a heart check. Because if I'm not walking in love, I'm walking in sin. Do I allow my old nature to control my thoughts and desires or does the divine nature of the Holy Spirit rule in me? When temptation comes, do I play with it or do I flee from it? Do I immediately yield to the Holy Spirit when he speaks to my conscience, asking me to do something or asking me not to do something? Do I immediately harden my heart to a suggestion from the Holy Spirit to extend myself beyond my comfort zone for the sake of the betterment of other people? If that is my heart, God's calling me for a renewal. We don't want to be like the church in Sardis. We need to come back to our first love. See, if we don't have love, the candlestick will be removed from this place. Candlestick? This church will die if we don't get this one because there's no power in liturgy 
for the sake of liturgy and religion for the sake of tradition. There's no power in that. It's all about relationships. It's all about our love for God and for each other. And if it becomes anything other than that, we need to repent.